Exodus, Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32, going to be reading tonight about the, about the golden calf. You hear people refer to the golden calf, we do not even know that it's in the Bible. But we're going to look at the story of the golden calf, then we'll, then we'll ask a question that Moses asked of the children of Israel. Basically, he was asking people to come out and make a decision whose side you're on. I think many times that, that we declare that in different ways. We can declare it by what we say, and then we can declare it by what we do. And we'll talk with you about that tonight. If you have it, Exodus 32. Would you stand with me, please, for our reading of the Scripture, beginning in verse 15. 15. Exodus chapter 32, verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf, and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. Can you sympathize with him? You've been up there with God in the, the most holiest communion that you could imagine. Getting the word of God. And down at the base of the mount, the congregation has gone into idolatry. They're stripped down uh, to nothing. Dancing around, singing African music worshiping a false god with a mixed multitude that had come up out of Egypt. And they, he, he says, he, well, the Bible says in verse 20, he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder. Have you ever been, have you ever been this frustrated to want to uh, make your children drink what they're playing with? Yeah. <laughs> ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For, as for this Moses the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said, do you all understand? Y'all remember that, that Aaron is Moses' brother. Okay? I mean, he's been betrayed in uh, the service of God by his own flesh and blood brother. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. Now you watch this, and you tell me if a staff member at a church, Baptist church might not lie. Okay? I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Yeah. <laughs> if there's any place in your Bible where I would say that in the notes of your Bible, in the margin of your Bible, you might just draw a smiley face, that would be one. <laughs> and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate, from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to 
the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today. You remember me reading this this morning? Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Even every man upon his son and upon his brother that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. So Moses took a great stand and he insisted on it being dealt with and it resulted in, uh, in God having them slay 3,000 men. But I want you to notice that Moses still cared for the whole congregation. And verse 31 the Bible says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Oh my, what a spirit. I don't know about you, and I don't know what all that entails, but I don't know if I could pray and take somebody's place and go to hell for anybody. You know, I, I don't know that, that you can take that verse that far. But I'd like you to look back, please, at verse 26 for our text. We'll read it and pray. Then Moses, verse 26, stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Tonight, I realize that we've got people who love the Lord enough having been through a fairly grueling physical effort this morning with all that we did just in going to church. And I'm not, I'm not bragging on you. I'm just saying I realize that, that most of the more dedicated people probably have come to this service. But I want to use that text tonight to stir us all up to be on the Lord's side. Amen. Heavenly Father, please bless the message tonight to our hearts. I want to be a blessing to this congregation pray that you'd use me in proclaiming the Word of God. pray that you'd help me to be a good example. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be an encouragement to everybody that's saved and has any desire at all to do right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Won't you be seated? This is, a, this is kind of like an Old Testament example uh, of a public invitation. I actually have got a, a little booklet available uh, on the subject. I, I preached two messages uh, on the subject of a public invitation in time past. I don't know that I preached them here. And we, we put them into printed form in a little uh, booklet. I do believe in a public invitation. I try to be sure to let people know that nobody gets saved by walking an aisle. But I do encourage people to walk the aisle for various reasons. Let me say to you Christian people here at Glenwood, if you want your church to be thriving, if you want your church to uh, have make changes that are right, then I would encourage every last one of you to be available, to be moldable, to be flexible, to be sensitive to God, and be willing to respond at public invitations that we give here after the messages at Glenwood Baptist Church. You do not have to be getting saved Amen. to uh, answer the altar call. You do not have to have committed adultery or, or killed someone during the week to respond at the altar call. And I'm telling you, the more that God's people will, will let the Lord speak to them and then they respond, uh, the more we're going to be in communion with God. God doesn't talk to us just for us to listen and do nothing. Any of you had children that you tried to instruct them or get on to them about something and they just stood there and looked at you? <laughs> yeah. And you, and you wish that they would acknowledge that they received something you said? You know, earth to boy, earth to boy, is anyone there? You know, yeah. type of thing. And, uh, and, and you say, say something. And so it kind of is a, our way of responding uh, to the Lord. I believe and giving a, a public invitation. Now, here there was a crisis. And the crisis was due to the fact that even though that the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, not all of Egypt had come out of the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, in the midst of the congregation of Israel was a multitude of people 
who did not love God at all. And Moses said, I want those who love God to identify yourselves. I want those who believe in God and don't believe in this calf to identify yourself. I want you to take a stand. Dearly beloved, we need to realize that in churches, we had a big day this morning, and there are crowds in, that meet in various churches that by no means uh, indicates that every person in there loves God. Uh, when crowds meet, it's a blessing if you've got a lot of people in the crowd who love God. But the crowd itself is no indication that everybody there really loves God. They may love rock music, which is what some churches have to try to get their crowds. They may love dinner on the ground. Amen. Which is what some, draws some crowds. They may love country western music or whatever's going on at the church. Uh, I want to call you, my friends, to identify yourselves with the message tonight being the question that Moses asked. This is the title for the message, Who is on the Lord's side. I believe it was Francis Havergal that, that pinned that down into a hymn that is in our hymn book, Who is on the Lord's side? I want to give you a few thoughts from this passage. And we'll take this passage and give you just some examples of how that, um, that this passage can show you a few truths. I'm not saying these are the only things that indicate whether or not you're on God's side. I want to be on God's side. If you're on God's side, it's more likely He's going to be on your side. Amen. Amen. And so I want to say, first of all, that when you look at this passage, and I realize we did not read the entire chapter, but if you still have your Bible there, I'd like you to look at verse 1. I'm going to read uh, this verse, which is rather a lengthy verse. Uh, what happened was, is Moses left uh, the congregation. He went on vacation. I'm comparing that to a, to a Baptist church. Where the, where the pastor uh, left the church, went out on vacation for two weeks, and he came back, and the church name was changed. It was no longer Glenwood Baptist Church. It was Glenwood Community Worship Center. <laughs> and when he came back, there was a new song leader in there, and he had on skinny jeans <laughs> and, uh, and, a, uh, and a stained T-shirt, and they had uh, rock music in there. And he said, what in the world is going on here? Who is on the Lord's side? Let me say first of all, using number verse number one for our thoughts, I want to say those who are on the Lord's side are those who will stay right with God even if the preacher is not around. Amen. Yeah. Verse one, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And this is an example of things that happen with staff members in various churches where you've got a pastor that loves God and he's got somebody that is like an assistant perhaps, staff member or whatever, but he doesn't have the strength uh, that Moses had and so he gives in. Uh, to the congregation. God held Aaron and the people uh, guilty of making this golden calf. They both were in it together. Aaron lied to his brother when he said that I, I put in the, 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 all the jewelry and everything and out came this, path, this calf. The Bible says that he fashioned this calf. They, fight, they made this calf uh, with engraving tools. I'm reminded of, of Absalom uh, uh, conspiring behind David's back. Uh, uh, Adonijah conspiring and being a traitor behind uh, David's back. Judas, of course, with our Lord and others. While Moses was up in the mount, the people were in a mess. I believe that, it, that uh, as Dr. Lee Robertson used to say for so many years, everything rises and falls upon leadership. I do believe that leadership needs to be right, but that includes the assistant. That includes the Aaron in the church. And that means that all of us need to be on guard that we don't get in a mess just because that somebody's not around. Come on, some of y'all remember way back when, uh, when you were at home and mom and dad took off? Did you, did you take the opportunity to do wrong? Mom and dad go off for a whole week? 
And you had the house? Come on. Come on. Were there parties there? Yeah. Did you did you mess up? That's what the children of Israel did, basically. Moses was up in the mount getting the commandments of God. The people were in a mess down below, uh, letting the infiltration of a mixed multitude, the Bible calls it, where they brought all of the junk out of Egypt, the, the mysticism and the worship and the nakedness and the uh, dance and the... Uh, and the singing and all that brought all of that out and incorporated it into uh, an Israelite worship service. Yeah. It made God Almighty angry enough to where thousands of people died as a result of it. Moses was in an intimate fellowship with God, but the people at the same time were in idolatry and fornication. Sometimes I'll hear preachers preach to one another in these preachers' meetings, and the preacher's meetings are good, and they uh, encourage one another, and, and they seem to think that if every preacher would just get right, we would have revival in America. And they seem to indicate sometimes that if the uh, preachers were right, then America would not be in the awful shape that it's in. I'm not going to take away the responsibility of leadership in local churches. The character of a man in the pulpit is the chief thing that is referred to in 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's almost nothing said whatsoever about the man's ability to preach. If you enjoy your pastor's preaching, that's wonderful. I'm glad because one of my main jobs as a pastor is to feed the flock. That's one of my main jobs, is to feed the sheep. And if you get something out of it, everything that I do here uh, has that as one of the top priorities. The Bible Institute is for no other reason than to feed somebody that's willing to get it, okay? Uh, I teach Sunday school and have taught just about my whole pastoral uh, experience uh, uh, because it's part of God's responsibility He's given me to feed the sheep. I preach the Bible because God, but the character is what's mentioned in 1 Timothy 3. It, it, almost, it doesn't say anything about his ability to start after noon on Sunday morning like we did this morning and get people who will stay there long enough to, to listen to the sermon and then respond to the invitation knowing that there's food right back here waiting on all of us. No, the qualifications have to do with character. But what a blessing it is when you have people who will follow the pastor's uh, leadership of godliness and character. Uh, the, the pastor in 1 Peter chapter 5 is not to be lords over God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. Amen. He's supposed to live in such a way so that if you live in the way he lives, you're living right. Yes. Amen. 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 If the preacher's not living right, then you can't follow him and be living right. 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 Preacher's got to live right, and he's to do that as an example to the congregation. Those who are on the Lord's side, are those who have seen how the preacher uh, lives, they've seen his walk with God, and they have incorporated that into their own heart and into their own life, and they know how to work, walk with God. Amen. Amen. Woe be to the congregation that is very long without a preacher. God puts pastors over churches for a reason. But a pastor should not have to be there Every service, and you folks know I'm in this pulpit all the time. Amen. I'm almost never gone from this pulpit. Amen. Six years I've been out of this pulpit on two Sundays, and both Sundays I was preaching somewhere else. A preacher ought not to have to be in the pulpit every service for the children of God to show up at church. Amen. Amen. If, if he goes on vacation, and I'm not trying to get you all ready for me going on vacation, but if the Lord will let me, I'm going to take one wish tonight off for our Mrs. O'Neill's and our 50th wedding anniversary. Amen. I might even take off a Sunday and go somewhere for our 50th wedding anniversary if we stay together that long and celebrate our 50th <laughs> wedding anniversary. Right. <laughs> but if I'm going for a whole Sunday and I come back and I find that, that the church sign says Glenwood Worship Center, I am going to be a living illustration of Moses coming down from the mount. I just may go out there with a sledgehammer, and I do have a couple of sledgehammers. 
I've been around uh, Brother Boatwright, and he taught me that you ought to have at least two or three of everything. That you yeah. need. <laughs> That's right. I got a couple of sledgehammers, and I just might come out, and if it says Glenwood Community Worship Center, I just might come down there and split it right down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Moses was communing with God, getting the Ten Commandments. The people were corrupting themselves with a golden calf. Uh -huh. Who's on the Lord's side? If I am out, I could get sick. I could have anything happen to me. If I ever am out, it'd be a blessing to know that this church does not cancel Wednesday night service because something happened to me. Amen. But we can't only have church anyway. Yeah. If I know I'm going to be out, I'd do my best to have this pulpit filled by somebody. We've got, we've now got uh, actually two preachers attending. I don't know if you'll notice that fellow that I brought uh, this morning. He's a retired preacher as well, just like Brother Bill there that does our announcements. And either one of them could fill the pool. But I, of course, I'd get Brother Bill first but because uh, he's a member and been faithful. But that man, he's, a, he's uh, 90 years old and a former preacher as well. I'd fill the pulpit, but it'd be a blessing to know you're going to do right anyway. Amen. My friend, let me encourage you. I can't see you. I'm not spying on you. I'm not looking uh, to try to find fault with you. But it'd be a real blessing if every last person at Glenwood Baptist Church started off your day in prayer Amen. every day mm -hmm. and in the Word of God Amen. every day. Amen. It blessed this preacher's heart because I would be thinking that our people are developing a walk with God. Amen. They love God's Word. Amen. They really believe in prayer. They really believe it. And when, the, and when the door opens, even apart from our Saturday morning visitation, which all of you all take part in Saturday visitation, all of you. Amen. But apart from that, uh, in addition to that, you could witness every day as the Lord opens up doors. Second thing I want to say about who is on the Lord's side, here's another way to identify him in verse 4. Verse 1, those who stay right when the preacher was away. People saw that Moses delayed coming to the mountain. That's when they went and got into their devil. Number two, in verse four, I'll say that the ones who are on the Lord's side are those who take a stand against false worship. Those who are willing to take a stand against false worship. <coughs> Churches ought to take a stand for what is right. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to take a stand on this King James Bible. Amen. We'll take a stand on salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Amen. who died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And we'll take a stand on the second coming. We'll take a stand on eternal security of the believer. Amen. We'll take a stand on the, on the doctrine of the Trinity, of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We'll take a stand on, on the doctrines of holiness. And by the way, I'm going to take a stand on redemption by the blood. Amen. Amen. Facebook not too long ago, I, I got on a little rant again about John MacArthur and his heresies against the blood of Christ. Even though he's tried to disguise them, he still has never repented of them. And uh, says that the blood that's mentioned in the Bible only refers to the death of Christ. And they say that we got our theology too much affected by the hymn books. I got my theology affected by this book. Amen. This book told me that I was washed in His blood from my sins. Amen. In Revelation chapter 1. I'm redeemed by the blood. Amen. God bought the church with His own blood. Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says. Now I'll take, I'm going to take a stand for something. What a blessing it would be to know that you folks, when you get out there on the job, or with your family, friends, or whatever, it'd be a blessing to know that you took a clear-cut stand. Some of you know what it's like. To, to have the opportunity to take a stand. What do you do? Do you cave? If you're on the Lord's side, you stand against false worship. Verse 4. And he received them at their hand. Now we didn't read this, but I told you that it happened. That calf didn't just come out fully, fully made. He received them at their hand, verse 4, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. Preacher lied. The assistant preacher, whatever you want to call him. Aaron, the, the leader's brother, lied. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up uh, out of the land of Egypt. 
The book of Jude is a little book, but it's a powerful book. It tells us to earnestly contend for the faith. My friend, you ought not to be a Bible-believing Baptist just simply because you wandered into our church one day. There ought to be some time where you get a, a communion between you and God where you really believe what we preach here. Amen. 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 I'm glad for anybody who came and visited our church because we visited you or because if somebody was nice to you, invited you, or you came even for one of our dinner on the ground. But if you come with a receptive heart, God will change you Amen. if you'll let him. And he'll turn you into somebody who will be on the Lord's side Amen. all the time. That's right. Even when Moses is up in the mount. You'll be willing to take a stand against false worship. You'll take a stand and you won't just say that the Mormons are an unfortunate group, aren't they? Yeah. <coughs> You'll say they're a cult. Amen. That's right. You'll say that the charismatic is a is a demonic thing that has got a counterfeit spirit that's not the Holy Spirit in it. Right. You know the difference between John the Baptist and Benny Hinn. Yeah. Amen. False deities, false dependencies, false doctrines, whatever is false, if you're on the Lord's side, you'll take a stand against it and you'll stand for truth. Third thing I'd like you to look at is in verse 17. We read this passage, verse 17 through 19, where Joshua said, Oh man of God, there's a sound of war in the camp. Wait a minute, that's not war, that's music. Yeah. <laughs> oh Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> What's really sad to me is, it's sad that even in Baptist churches, if they do try to sing the old song, they will not sing the old song like the old songs were sung. That's right. Amen. They just cannot stand yeah. to sing without polluting it with the world's music. Yeah. Right. Before you know it, everybody up there will be swinging and swaying. Yeah, swaying. <laughs> Never seen a preacher do that, has <laughs> Who's on the Lord's side? Those who shun the music and morals of Egypt. Amen. Amen. There are there are churches that have half-dressed people yeah. singing on the platforms. Women, men up here, undressed almost. I'm not saying necessarily like it was there, but undressed almost, immodest. Yeah. Because their heroes, their models that they follow is what they see on TV. That's right. And they follow their example yeah. because they've been stirred by the physical thing by watching them on television or at their concerts if they're worldly enough to go to worldly concerts. He said it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, it's the voice, it's the voice of the noise of them that sing, do I hear? This was dance music. Yeah. Folks, if God will help me, and I appreciate the cooperation of the people of this church. They told me when I came here that they liked that they thought that one of the good things about Glenwood is that we still sing out of the old hymn books. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God will help me. If I've got any influence over this church at all, we'll never change from that. Amen. Amen. Right. We're going to sing the old hymns right. from the hymn book. Amen. I'm not totally against any kind of use of these screens, but you're not going to find it while I'm here. Yeah. We have screens up. It's going to say something else. It's going to say something like, look at your hymn book. <laughs> I'm a smart aleck. If we ever get some hymn, if I get control of the screens and we get the screens up here, it's going to say, look at the words in your hymn book. Yeah. Look at the notes in your hymn book. Yeah. Learn to sing four-part yeah. harmony. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, we got to take a stand. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to go to a church anywhere without having to put up with that music. One of our members is sitting here in the congregation uh, talked to me about visiting a, an independent Baptist church and I believe they were, they were standing right on the King James Bible and he tried to be nice about it to try to describe to me the kind of music that they had there. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember exactly how he described it but I knew what he was talking about. Yeah. I knew it was, it was a combination of, of Nashville. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember any of the old country stars? 
I can start naming them, that's, that's, that was the spirit of what he was uh, uh, involved in in going to that church. Somebody said, rock, rap, and the ridiculous is what we're finding in most of our churches these yeah. days. Dance music, defiling music, I believe it's devilish music. If you don't believe that the spirit world can get involved in music, you just don't know your Bible. King Saul was troubled by the spirit world. He said, I need help. I'm, I'm restless. I'm troubled. That's where he met David. He said, we know somebody who's able to play the harp in such a way that has an effect on people's spirit. He said, well, go get it. And David came and he played the harp. He played the music. Perhaps he sang. The Bible doesn't say that he sang there. He played the music. Such a way that the evil spirit left Saul. Amen. You know what that means? Yeah. That means evil spirits like certain kinds of music. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And they don't like other kinds of music. Yeah. That's right. Miss O'Neill, uh, brother Jacob Kim, she's, she's uh, friends with him on Facebook. He's a friend in South Korea. And he's trying to learn English. Every now and then he'll send me a little video praying for Pastor O'Neill. <laughs> he goes to Prayer Mountain there where he lives in South Korea. But anyhow, he sent, he sent me a, a couple of clips where he's got his phone there showing the dashboard of his car as he's driving each morning to Prayer Mountain to have prayer for you. Amen. He prays for our church. Amen. And a couple of the times that I've watched it, it would be like maybe a minute long, but a couple of times that I've watched it, uh, he would have music play. Yeah. And it was great sounding music. Amen. I didn't even recognize the hymns, but it was the music that you could listen to and you would not be thinking about getting out and fornicating, drinking, or dancing. Amen. It, was strictly, it was strictly and real worship. My friends, let's take a stand. Amen. Let's take a stand on the right kind of music. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, with the influence that I have with you people, and I only have what God gives me and you give me. Yeah. I don't want to try to force but if you give me the opportunity to make choices, I'm going to try to lead our church in the right direction. Amen. And, when it comes to, and when it comes to music like this, I have done my best to err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't have certain things going on here with regard to our music because I don't want to be riding the edge. Yeah. I don't want to do what I can. I don't care. I don't care who it is that's got so great talents and if we could just get them in, you know that lots of people come to hear their singing. Yeah. We're just not going to do it. Yeah. The fourth thing I want to say is that if the ones who are on the Lord's side are those, verse 26, our text, are those who are willing to step out. They'll, step out, they'll be willing to step out from among the ones who pushed for the false worship. They're willing to step out from among the ungodly. That's right, amen. And folks, there comes a time where Christian people need to be willing. Doesn't matter if even if they name the name of Christ, if they're not departing from iniquity, you ought to depart from them. Amen. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Yeah. And Moses said, who is on the Lord's side, let him come yeah. unto me. Verse 26, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. You need to step out. Yeah. You need to step out. And uh, if, I'm talking about saved people now. This is a message primarily to save people. If you're not saved, I pray that God will somehow get you under conviction like we have people under conviction this morning. But for saved people, that means you take a stand and get out from amongst that crowd that doesn't believe in church and you become a member of a church and you be faithful to it. Amen. Right, amen. Church membership, I believe in it. You say, well, you're a pastor. Yeah, it probably has something to do with it, but I believe in it. Amen. I believe you ought to be identified by a local church. Amen. Courtship and marriage. you got to just be willing. We live, in a, we live in a day where people don't even know which restroom to go in. Much less how to court. Yeah. Much less how to how how to marry. Amen. Folks, God's way of marriage is not for you to shack up first and then if you like it, let's let's go ahead and put on a ring. Yeah. Amen. God's way of marriage is, is you pray, God supplies the person, you court them, you pray over it, you have confidence, that's what God wants you to do. 
Then you marry, you enter into a covenant with one another, Amen. then you come together Amen. physically. Amen. Courtship and marriage, somebody's got to take a stand and do what is right. Yep. Thankful for a young couple recently in our church who got married. Thank Amen. God for them there tonight. Amen. Amen. Another step we need to take is in companionship, and that's just in your friends. Yep. Yeah. Your friends Amen. have a lot to do with your character. That's right. Yep. I know, that, I know that we all want to be our own man, our own woman, or whatever. But who we hang with, who we run with, all the time, that tends to influence us. Right. And if you're not careful, they influence you in a bad way. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I believe in being friendly to everybody. I'm not as friendly as my wife is, but, uh, but I try to be friendly to everybody. I believe in that. But you ought not to make companions Amen. out of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. right. Don't become a companion mm -hmm. with the ungodly. There are people that you have, some of you will work with yeah. all day long, yeah. five days a week perhaps. Amen. You're going to have to work at it right. to not become a companion. Because it's not good that the man should be alone, the Lord said, back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And man tends to look for companionship. That, of course, talking about the companionship of marriage. But if you're not careful, you'll get lonely on the job. You get lonely in the neighborhood or whatever, and you'll make the wrong kind of companions. Take a stand and become a companion of the people who love the Lord. Amen. Let them be the people. You're not going to find any perfect people, but be a companion of people that have the right attitude Amen. where they want to love God. Let's stand together, heads bowed. Who is on the Lord's side?